fine. So as I anticipated, so we, uh, sorry, I, I promised to uh, show you also some block diagram of the control scheme, but uh, we were, went too long. So I will, may uh, come back to this later, but it's just uh, reprising things that we have seen already in Robotics One and how they extend to torque control. So I would like to devote the rest part of this, uh, this lecture to uh, some sneaking inside the videos that we will uh, use later on to illustrate the various parts. And in particular, I, uh, I will present video covering uh, this type of topics. So the first one will be, the uh, first two actually will be on kinematic redundancy, which is uh, the second topic of the course and related control methods. So the fact that we have a redundant system, uh, but what would, do we do with this redundancy? How we control the robot in such a way that we exploit redundancy in the way we uh, prefer. So according to some criterion, to some objective and to some constraint. Uh, the second uh, video uh, plus some slides, uh, will be devoted to robot dynamic modeling. We'll see how, how this is done and what does it mean to identify the numerical value of the various quantities, so-called dynamic coefficient that are present in the dynamic model itself. Uh, then we will move to a, a couple of videos that illustrate the interaction with uh, the environment. So where the purpose is both moving in contact, as we have seen here, and controlling the exchange of forces. And the environment may be a, a static environment or maybe a human interacting with the, with the robot as well. Uh, the fourth of this five block will be illustrating some effect of that joint elasticity that we have seen uh, in, the, in this simple model. What happens to a robot that displays joint flexibility or elasticity. And sometimes this elasticity is introduced on purpose. And in fact, there's a new generation of uh, actuators and of uh, lightweight robots that have what is called variable stiffness actuation. And we'll see some VSA, this is the acronym, uh, robot. In my view, this will be the actuation of the next generation of robots because it's like, uh, it's very much bio-inspired by the agonistic antagonistic uh, feature of our muscles. So you have for each joint essentially two actuators and with the two actuators, you can command both motion and modify online while moving the stiffness of your joint. Like if you're doing a motion with your arm with a soft arm or the same motion by stiffening the arm. You're, you're using this uh, duplication of actuation, and this is done uh, for a number of reasons. We will see some simple examples. And finally, this is a huge part, a very important part. I will never uh, be tired to repeat this. So the human-robot interaction and collaboration under physical uh, condition and under safety constraint, because indeed, if we bring the robot in contact with the human, the first thing that we care is safety of the human. The second thing we care is safety of the robot, okay, because the robot can be damaged as well. Uh, so uh, this will be illustrated through a couple of videos. Okay, so let's start with this video. Any of you remember this? It's exactly the same video with which I started Robotics One. I only change, I mean, apart from some uh, refinement, I only changed the subtitle. Because uh, at that time we were only dealing with kinematic redundancy. Now I say kinematic slash dynamic control of the redundancy. And also a specific algorithm that we will see in detail, the so-called saturation in the null space, SNS algorithm that we developed a few years ago, that is able to handle the use redundancy in order to avoid that you hit some hard bounds on robot motion. And the bounds are joint limits or velocity limits. 
or acceleration limits, or even torque limits. At, at that point, you have a dynamic issue, okay? So uh, the idea here is that uh, this robot is, by the way, it's one of the robot, of the robot with which we have done uh, most uh, experiment in our lab. This was uh, still in the lab of Stanford. We, in 2012, we didn't have this robot at home. And uh, one of our PhD students went there and implemented the, the, the idea that we had in mind and we have replicated things here. So uh, this is the lightweight, seven degrees of freedom, seven joints revolute. Uh, the task that the end effector should do is just a positional task. So the tip of the finger, you see this tool, I mean, it's just a finger, uh, should move in 3D according to some trajectory. So the task is three dimensional. The robot has seven degrees of freedom. So we can have four degrees of redundancy in the sense. Okay, what do we do with this? Here, we avoid the bounds of joint motion, but also we avoid the presence of collision with the environment. You see that the robot starts, will start from the uh, top, uh, the red dot uh, I, the red line is essentially the transient to which the position of the end effector will reach the target motion, which is going along the circle, the green circle. So this is the transient part. You have an error that you have to recover and then you start doing the rotation at constant speed. But this rotation, of course, I mean, the tip should rotate along this Cartesian position trajectory, but it can be done in several ways. So we should do it in so, such a way that we don't get hit with the table. And you see that this circle is, goes very close to the surface. So while the tip standing, st being on the green trajectory will not hit the surface, but the rest of the body of the robot may hit the surface. So we use redundancy in order to avoid collision. It's like having some bounds that cannot be violated, both in the joint space because of the capability of the uh, actuators and of the kinematics, and in the Cartesian space because of the presence of obstacle around the robot. So uh, this is the motion. So the task, uh, we will see that the null space will be, uh, I mean, we already introduced the concept of null space. In fact, it's the null space of the Jacobian and then uh, the, their extension. Uh, when the Jacobian is non-square. So you see that more or less it goes. I, I superpose these green and red parts on the, on the video. So you see that it gets very close to the surface, but avoids to be there. Indeed, the obstacle is known because it's the table. We know where the table is with respect to the base frame. But the robot, you see, the elbow may hit, but in fact, the motion is such that you accommodate while the tip is doing the right circular path, the rest remains above the table, okay? And without hitting bounds in the joint space, okay? So this is something that can move from kinematics to dynamics once you include the proper dynamic model. It can be treated at the kinematic level, but also at the dynamic level, if you consider torque bounds, of course, you have to include the dynamics. If you just consider kinematic bounds, you can treat this at the kinematic level. I will make a presentation at the kinematic level, but because we introduce this as advanced kinematic stuff. In fact, here we, out of the redundancy, this is a way of using redundancy to satisfy hard bounds. So bounds that can never be violated. You cannot have a task that you approximately do. If you have a limit, you cannot exceed the limit at any time, okay? There are other situations where you would like to you know, follow a trajectory, but if you're not able, you relax, you will have an error, you minimize the error, but you can still do a trajectory motion. While violating hard bounds in the joint space or entering to object in the Cartesian space is impossible. So this is, requires a special treatment. So here is another nice example developed by a French group with which we have uh, partly collaborated from LAS in Toulouse, the center of uh, the CNRS center in Toulouse. 
uh, which deals with a humanoid. Now, you may have known, you, you may have heard myself speaking several times, we are not doing humanoid mobile robot, no? we're doing fixed base robots. But in this case, the humanoid is not walking, it's standing still. So it's like a serial manipulator with multiple branches, okay? So uh, many degrees of freedom for the HRP2. This is a Japanese uh, humanoid robot. And uh, you see that this, this is a technical paper, this is a scientific paper that has been uh, published uh, more or less 10 years ago at this time. Uh, and you see that it's called hierarchical quadratic programming because they formulate the problem of moving the many degrees of freedom of this robot. There are probably 40, 45 degrees of freedom. Uh, so we can do many things, but there are many tasks that you look with the, with the robot. And you organize the task in a prioritized way. It's like when you have to do many things in your daily life, there are priorities. So you try to do the high priority task. Of course, you would like to do everything. But if you cannot, you relax the low priority task. Sometimes you don't do this, but this is a different story. Okay, so it's hierarchically organized and it's formulated uh, in an incremental way so, uh, so that you can formulate locally a quadratic, solve a quadratic programming problem. So with uh, linear constraint and quadratic objective function so that you solve this in closed form at every sampling step. So while the robot is moving. And you will see now uh, different examples with equality constraint or inequality constraint. So like the bounds, but here in this approach, you can violate this bound unless you bring them to the top priority. So you bring an inequality constraint in the joint space, you cannot violate, it's the first thing that you have to solve. So you're using in part your redundancy for doing things that you cannot uh, avoid to do. And you will see for each task, there will be a prioritized order. So there will be a kind of a symbol of inequality saying which task has higher priority than other tasks. So let's start the video. Maybe I can. Okay, so in this experiment, uh, let, it, let me stop it here. So you see that the robot should track a moving ball with the right hand. So there's a ball moving, this is a simulation first. Huh? So moving ball in the workspace and with the hand, the robot should grasp huh, the, the object. However, uh, it should also look at the, so the, the humanoid has eyes, so has a head with eyes, so it should always look at this. Okay. Now imagine that there are situations where in order to stretch out, we cannot look and stretch, we may do something like this. So the task of looking at, so keeping the object in the field of view is something that can be separated from grasp. So we would like to do everything at the same time. And of course, the, the robot is standing on its feet, but it should remain in balance, it cannot fall. So the center of mass of the whole body should remain, so the, the vertical going through the center of mass should remain in the uh, support area, which is the convex hull of where the feet are placed. So there's an area, so this is like keeping equilibrium. Huh? If you do it on your body, you understand what you mean, okay? If you're standing on one feet, your support is only the standing feet, the, fe the feet on the ground. If you have two feet, the support area includes also the area, uh, the convex hull of the two feet, okay? So, uh, you try to do everything if you're not able, and there are conditions that you check at every sampling time, then you try to relax the lower priority order. And you see that here the highest priority is joint limits. So this is the first task. Never avoid, never violate this task, okay? And these are inequalities because if you're inside the joint range, there's no constraint. But if you get closer and you touch a limit, then this becomes a, an equality constraint. You cannot violate in one direction, but you can re-enter into the range. So the switching of active constraint and an active constraint is another 
critical point. So next to the joint limits, we have contact support. So uh, having uh, uh, the, the, the feet on the ground, then the grasp with the hand, then the field of view, and then the balance. It's strange to say that the balance is the last one, but the contact support is the first th task, then balance means in the sense not, I mean, within the equilibrium, you try uh, to stay close, but you can also violate in the limit this situation. So, and this is, oh, sorry, I stopped this, so. Uh, and this is what happens. Okay. The first experiment, it's a simulation again. You see uh, the yellow ball, the field of view, the ball is moved and the robot tries to grasp it while satisfying all constraints. And if not, it will relax, for instance, the field of view, like here. You know? So he's holding the object, but in order to reach there without falling, it needs to this, do this motion. And here is another situation where it has to turn the handle, but when it's too hard to use only one hand, then it uses both hands. So it asks more degrees of freedom in order to apply more force. And we have seen that, of course, with two arms, you have multiple actuators uh, involved in the rotation, while not colliding with the other environment and, and doing the task. The third experiment, let me pause it here, uh, is um, the fact that, again, with the ball moving around in the workspace, but you try to use only the upper limbs. So not to uh, bend down, uh, to stay with your trunk up, to stay with your straight legs and move only the arm. But of course, if the ball goes down, you have first to bend the trunk and possibly also bend your knees, okay? So you see that you organize this motion, really specifying task in a hierarchical way, and then you see what happens. So it's not, you're not fully programming the motion of 45 joints. You let this joint move according to your objective, and which these objectives are organized as several tasks. And you can do this because you have many degrees of freedom and you have redundancy. Okay, so this, we will see how to do this in practice. So let me continue with the, the video. Again, the yellow ball, now it's simple. You see that uh, the, the robot is not really standing with straight legs, but this is the normal position. So the chest remains straight. Now the, now the legs uh, change first, and then the chest is being bent in this condition. Okay, so you see that you can organize uh, motion. And of course, if you relax the grasping condition, the other task brings back the robot is in upper trunk and straight leg. And this is, has been also uh, implemented on the robot. Uh, the ball is not there. The ball is, I mean, the robot sees a virtual ball, which is this yellow that moves from one place to the other. All the rest is is real. And of course, uh, this ball is being brought into a box with real oranges. Okay, so this is uh, a superposition of augmented reality with real world. Okay, so uh, you see that this is controlling the motion using this uh, task priority methods, handling uh, equality and inequality constraint with priorities. Okay, so these uh, three videos are, uh, there are two real videos and one simulation. These have been uh, taken in uh, our lab. This is again the KUKA lightweight robot. And here we are acquiring data in order to do identification of the coefficients uh, of the dynamic model. So we have first derive the model in a symbolic form, like we have written the model for the single mass or two mass, more or less, it's much more complex, but there's a systematic way of doing this. So once you have this, you reorganize your model and you have to put numbers in place of the masses, inertias, and so on. 
how, where do you get this number? You get this by generating some motion, so applying some torque, so you know it is the torque that you're applying, and collecting the actual motion of the robot from the encoder measurement. So offline from the motion of the joints, so the Q, you can also take the Q dot and Q double dots, the first and second derivative. And this is not, it's, it's a critical task, but not so critical because you can do this offline. You don't have to do it while moving. And then you can formulate uh, essentially a least square problem and solve for the uh, coefficient in the model. And of course, once you have done this, you would like, like in any case, when you estimate something, you would like to validate your estimate. So you do a model validation by considering new motion. You see here, the robot is moving and it is exploring all the configuration in its, in its workspace. Actually, uh, the method that we've implemented takes advantage of some software capability of this robot. Otherwise, you should explore the configuration but also with different speeds, because this will excite some Coriolis and centrifugal effect. We don't need to do this here because of reason that we will detail later on. Okay, now once you have done this, uh, you take a, a new trajectory. So you have put the, some numbers that you have identified from this experiment in your model. And now you use the model in inverse dynamic form. So you say, if I want to do some new motion, not the one that I, uh, where I collect the data. No, this is very important. The validation should be done on a different set of motion. If I want to do this set of motion now, and uh, I compute the torque that I give to the motors based on the identified model, and I see if I realize exactly that motion. And this is the validation, okay? So these are different motion with respect to the one on the left where we acquire data. And of course, all this can be also simulated, and this is what happens with a simulator that you have in VREP. The model of the KUKA Lightweight Robot 4 is already there, so you have only to interface this with your own code. And remember that uh, Coppelia Sim, the new name of VREP, uh, there's a, an educational freeware. Of course, uh, you can buy the license and you can do more fancy stuff, but the educational version is more than enough what you need, okay? In fact, we have always worked with the educational freeware version. Okay, so to get into the picture, let's consider only the effect of gravity. Now, we have seen it in one of the example on the Blackbird, uh, where the QR robot was interacting with the environment and we had gravity and we said, okay, we have to cancel gravity of the picture, then the problem remains a pure kinematic one with the J transpose. So the gravity term, so how the gravity acceleration, so the gravity field in which we are immersed act on motion depends only on the configuration, okay? So if you think of your arm in a certain configuration, if I'm here standing still, I have to sustain gravity. Of course, there are some configuration where I don't have to sustain gravity. For instance, if I put my arm down, of course here gravity is zero. Also, here, gravity is zero, although this is an unstable equilibrium because as soon as I move it out, I will fall, okay? So there are configurations where, I mean, gravity changes with configuration. So I can write a vector of gravity torque, so one torque for each joint. So this G is a seven di dimensional vector, function of the configuration, but not function of anything else because in order to sustain gravity in this configuration, it makes no, sense, no difference if I'm standing still here or passing with some velocity through this configuration. The gravity field is a potential field, so it depends only on position of the bodies, so on the configuration of the arm. Clear enough? So this is why we can write G of Q. Now this G of Q, so a vector function of the configuration which contains a number of parameters, can be always factorized by a matrix Y, which has as many rows as the components of G, so in this case, seven rows, times a number of columns, as many as are the dynamic coefficients that appears in the model, okay? 
in this case, the pi grec of g, the dynamic coefficient, is given by this symbolic expression. And there are, in fact, 3, 6, 9, 12 such coefficients. There are this symbolic expression that you have obtained by doing the symbolic modeling of the dynamics of the arm. And if you look carefully, you recognize some, uh, some parameters which are relevant. M3, M4, 5, 6 to 7 are the masses of link 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You see, for instance, there is no mass of link 1. Why is that? Why the mass of link 1 is irrelevant? What do you think? So let me go back to the previous and let's see how, so the, the, the link one is this object below. I don't know if you see my, yeah. Is this mass here and when it moves, so it rotates, but the center of mass is exactly on the axis. So it's compensated, it's like the previous case. The mass of the first link does not feel the gravity because the, axis is vertical, okay? In fact, when you do the modeling, you don't, this is not an assumption a priori, it's the result of your modeling and you will find that mass one is disappeared. What are these C uh, number X, Y, Z are the coordinate of the vector going from the origin of the frame attached to the link, the kinematic frame, so the Denevitatelier frame, to the center of mass. In general, in our previous planar case, we call this DC1, DC2. It's just a scalar. In the general case, the center of mass uh, is located by a vector with three components, X, Y, Z of link four, five, six, seven, and these are the, and you see that there are product of masses times distances, all have the same units. Pay attention, if you find a single mass in this expression, you have done some mistake because you're adding apples and oranges. Masses are kilograms, mass times a distance are kilograms times meter, okay? So, in fact, you see that they are all consistent. And D2 is a kinematic parameter. It's a, actually the D2 of Denavi Tartinger, one of the four dynamic parameters. So you see that you have these things. Now you do this experiment and you extract some numbers for this coefficient, which means that the gravity term, once you put these numbers inside and you know which configuration the robot has, so you know Q and you know Q from your encoder measurement, then you can compute always the gravity in any configuration, okay? So this is only part of the model. And in fact, when we do the validation, here you see some motion and you don't really tell the difference between the retrieved G of Q, which is an information that uh, the KUKA controller can give only numerically, and the one that we have computed with our identified model. The plots are fully superposed, okay? So we were able to identify correctly the parameters that the manufacturer may know, but does not give to the user. Okay, so we had, we made a sort of reverse engineering here we ask for the parameters, they say no, and we said, okay, we will find them by ourselves, and we publish uh, in, a, in a journal so that everybody can use it, okay? So, uh, this was just gravity, but the model that I wrote at some point in, in my, on the blackboard, so this phi of q, q dot, q double dot, in fact, in general, takes this form. You have a, a, an inertia matrix, which is a function of the configuration, times the acceleration. Then you have terms which depends on the velocity, which are the Coriolis and centrifugal forces. And then you have the gravity, and then you have the input torques produced by the motor. This is the general form of the dynamic model, okay? Now, when we're doing identification, each of this term can be factorized like the gravity part. So you can estimate the coefficient inside, not only G, but also inside C and inside M of Q. And then uh, you can compare uh, 
the result with some desired motion. So if we model the system like this and we neglect the presence of friction, you see that there's no friction in this model, huh? like the tau friction that, or the F friction that we have introduced in one of these examples. And then we do the testing and we compare, the, this robot has joint torque sensors, so we can really measure the, joint, the torque that passes through the transmission. And you can see that we were able to capture on a new motion with our prediction, the measurement from the sensor. The measurement is, uh, in, uh, uh, in blue, while the estimated torques based on our model are in green, and you see that they follow quite closely. There's an error of the order of one, two Newton meter, okay? Joint two is very accurate, but you should see the scale there. So the scale is from minus 50 to 50. Other plots seems to be dramatically in error, but in fact, there's a range between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5. So it's really within the one Newton meters, we capture the right dynamics of this system. However, we decided also to add a friction model. So, okay, what is left? Can we model also this part, which is pretty much difficult, I would say. It's a completely different story. So if we do this extra modeling and identification, and then we redo the experiment, including the identified joint model, joint friction model, and you compare the solution from left to the side, you see that there's a considerable improvement, okay? So the remaining part was mainly due to the friction which was missing in the first dynamic model, okay? Okay. Then uh, we move to uh, motion and interaction control. These uh, are two short videos taken again from DLR. Uh, we, have, uh, we have had a long collaboration with DLR. Uh, I spent also part, my only sabbatical I spent in 2005 uh, in this center of uh, the German Aerospace Center near Munich. So here you see uh, again the KUKA lightweight robot on the left hand side, he's carrying a heavy payload. Now this KUKA has harmonic drives. So it's a very light weight robot. In fact, the whole robot weighs 14 kilograms, 14, so one four, and is able to carry 14 kilograms of payload. So its own weight. If you remember correctly, uh, when we talk about industrial robot in general, we say that because of the requirement of being accurate and massive, we have robots which may weigh 130 kilo or 250 kilo and have a payload of five kilograms, which is definitely a, a, a limitation, okay? Here, by control, we were able, I mean, the, the, the manufacturer and then the researcher that work on this, this uh, robot, we're able to guarantee the same accuracy despite the fact that you have this large, uh, I mean, large payload as opposed to the weight uh, of the robot, okay? However, and this is also thanks to the presence of harmonic drives. However, harmonic drives introduce flexibility in the structure, exactly that spring model that we have seen between the two masses. Uh, we are moving the motor, but the motor is not rigidly connected to the link. There is some transmission which has some compliance. So what happens with this compliance? Now, the video on the left will show that if you're taking a relatively heavy payload and you're stopping the motor, so the motor, are, you apply a torque so that the motor remains fixed. So you don't change the position of the motor. So if everything was rigid, you don't change the configuration. However, there's a, some compliance inside. So if you excite the end effector, you're moving a little bit the link and you're exciting this uh, flexibility. And this is what happens. So the motor are not moving, but because of the presence of some compliance in the structure, you have this oscillation. They are small oscillation, they are damped, so there is some friction that will 
dissipate energy and then they stop. But this makes uh, an object which is supposed to be very accurate, highly inaccurate if you're not able to compensate for this phenomenon, okay? Uh, on the right hand side instead, uh, there's a, an impedance control. So it's a way of handling the interaction. Now the interaction is made with a human pushing on the end effector and the robot reacts as if it was a mass spring damper system. So this is what we call the impedance control. So we let the interaction between forces and motion of the robot be modeled uh, by a target model, which is like a mass oscillating with some stiffness and some damping, okay? And of course you can set the parameter of this. You can have a large mass, a small damping, a large damping, a, a large stiffness, a small stiffness, whatever, in, in the various direction, reacting to forces applied to the end effector accordingly. And you see very clearly what happens if you change, if you play with this impedance model. So here it's relatively uh, damped. Here it's not damp at all. It's oscillate like a spring. And here again, you, you do self motion. So the position of the end effector is not moving, but the robot is reacting to forces applied on the structure by changing configuration, but keeping the same end effector position, okay? And orientation, I would say. Again, exploring redundancy. So here is a more classical situation. This is an industrial KUKA robot, a very heavy one. And the task is one that could be useful for a, a me machining operation with mechanical parts. So touching a, a, a contour and following a contour while applying the force, exactly what we have seen before. And the contour is not known in advance. So we have a learning phase where the stick mounted on the end effector, you see that the stick is held by the end effector, but between the stick and the flange of the robot, there's a force torque sensor. So you are measuring the contact force and also the moment in case, okay? So in, in this first part, we do surface following uh, and we have to move quite slowly in order not to lose contact. So we approach the surface, establish contact, we feel it through the force torque sensor, and then we move slowly while keeping a certain force measured so that we can reconstruct then the geometry from some force information. It's like if you were blind and you're touching something and you have to say, what is the shape of this object when uh, by only using force information. So this is the learning phase. Indeed, if you have a CAD model of the object, but you don't know where the object is, then you can use this information. And of course, you can locate the object by using vision. And if you do everything together, learning vision and CAD, you can do the task 50, 15 times as fast as before because you have a very good prediction of what is going on. So here you're moving at the desired speed, a high speed while applying a desired force on the normal direction because of everything that you have learned and fit into a model and so on, okay? Now, uh, this is contour following, it has its interest per se, but then you have some more uh, challenging tasks like assembly, so inserting object into holes. This is a paradigmatic task. Of course, you don't have a peg in hole problem in general, but you have to do assembly. And this can be modeled as a peg in hole insertion. And look at this strategy. This is a model-based insertion because you model the way in which the interaction can occur geometrically. And this uh, generates direction along which you can control forces or control motion. For instance, here, you're touching the surface and looking for a hole. So you're moving until you fold down the hole. And now the contact is not only a point contact uh, on the surface, is a multiple contact on the contour of the hole. And then from there, you, you know how to rearrange, rearrange the peg hold by the robot in such a way that you complete correctly the insertion, okay? 
So you see that you can reason about the interaction using geometric models, as we said, but also compliance characteristic of the interaction. And here is another uh, execution of the task. Okay, now uh, I told you about compliance is important, as you see in, even in this context. Uh, this is a, sem a simple uh, uh, system uh, developed by a spin-off of the University of Pisa, uh, which uses modular low-cost variable stiffness actuation device. This cube uh, units which are connected by plastic and you can build for instance the upper trunk of a robot or uh, a manipulator arm with this cube which give one degrees of freedom of motion but inside the cube there are two motors one controls the motion of this degree of freedom and one controls the stiffness how stiff is the transmission okay so you have a variable stiffness actuation and of course you can uh, uh, have a high stiffness like this or have a low stiffness. And you see that with the same amount of force you have larger oscillation. And these are only two cubes mounted with plastic connectors. Okay, this is a very low cost. And then we have some of this cube. By the way, this is, somebody asked me uh, if you can do some experimental activity in the project, uh, if you get to the project. Uh, for instance, these are devices that you can bring at home uh, if you have some electronics at home or you can use it in the lab if this is possible, okay? And of course, you can do fancy things. Let me... I don't know if you can hear it. You can throw things. You can increase the frequency. Actually, we had the demonstration here uh, in a one workshop. You can have very robust behavior because you have compliance in the structure. So you are not stiff enough. Imagine when you're holding a drilling machine, you have to make a, a, a hole in the wall. Now, the drilling machine is a very high vibratory object. If you have a stiff robot holding this, the robot will be destroyed by this vibration. Unless you are compliant so that you can absorb the high vibration content of such a device. Okay, so this is very important. Huh? Having compliance stru structure that are able to be robust with respect to external force. Uh, I was saying that this device, sorry, I, I will turn off the, <laughs> this device was uh, in a workshop that we organized some years ago here. We were able to make it, we program the variable stiffness in such a way that this simple object was playing the drums on one famous rock song. I don't know if you know My Sharona, if you have ever heard about that. If not, listen to that, listen to the drums there, and this was replicated by this type of robot. And could not be replicated by a, an industrial robot, which is too stiff for doing this high frequency uh, replication of periodic motion. Okay, and finally here, uh, the last, I hope this starts, yeah. The last uh, video shows, a, again, a peg in hole of operation where you take advantage of the compliance of the structure. So you start with a hole which has a diameter of 30 centimeter or three centimeter probably, and 29 is the peg. So you have kind of a, a clearance. So it's, it's easier to do the insertion. And then you uh, change the object and you have a situation where uh, the peg diameter is 29.5 millimeters and 30 millimeters is the, so three centimeters is the diameter of the hole. So now the clearance is smaller. It becomes harder to do the insertion. But you see that you bobble a little bit. So you use the compliance in order to uh, find the right way of inserting and then you're able to insert. It's like a trial and error, a, a probabilistic trial and error or random, I would say, but which uses the compliance in an active way. And then you have uh, the sliding with uh, even smaller tolerance. 
And these are tasks that are very hard to do if you don't have some compliance in the structure. If you remember well, in industrial setting where you don't have compliance joint or variable stiffness equation, you include a remote center of compliance as an extra device for doing the insertion. And this remote center of compliance is exactly giving the uh, flexibility to handle uh, small displacement or very strict tolerance in insertion. Okay, now last part is uh, about interaction, physical interaction. And this is a video here, I'm, I'm quite younger, uh, 15 years ago, uh, at the DLR where I was uh, in my sabbatical, where we experimented for the first time the capability of detect a collision between the robot and whatever, the human, but it could be anything else, without using sensor. So without using cameras or without using a touch sensor uh, or any other form of sensing, but only based on the uh, dynamic model derived for the robot and used to predict any extra force that intervened in the motion. So the robot was programmed to do a, a free motion back and forth. And as soon as it detects a collision, it flows in a, I mean, it stands still and then react to any additional force that you applied like a, a floating object, okay? And this is what happens. So the robot stops because it recognized that it hits something. And then from there on is gravity compensated and reacts to any force, even if there's no force sensing, okay? And this is based on the uh, use of a residual signal that we developed. And then later on, this concept was uh, embedded in KUKA industrial arm, I mean, of the lightweight generation. Uh, at that time, there was a master student, so somebody like you, Samia Dodi, uh, that worked with me in the DLR, and he was made a number of experiments. And this is one of the most famous video on this topic. So never do this, okay? So he tried on himself huh, the capability of stopping having recognized a connection, okay? So never do this unless you're 100% sure of what you're doing in your research, okay? So if you want to see this again, So the robot would have continued moving. So it was programmed for doing a full round, but then you recognize and it stopped suddenly. So uh, this was a smart student, I must say. In fact, now uh, is leading one of the big center in Europe of the robotics, uh, the Munich School of Robotics and Machine Intelligence. So I don't know if there's a connection between these things, but anyway, good to know. So, uh, here I have a, a longer video. This video, we presented it at a conference in Japan in 2013. Uh, and it was a finalist of the video competition. Unfortunately, we reached only the position three, but still uh, is a good value. It's a good video, which is partly simulated, partly experimental, which shows the capability of, in, of coexistence between a human and a robot. So the robot can, the human can enter into the workspace, get very close to the robot, and the robot, which is doing some periodic repetitive task, will recognize this by the presence of an external sensor, in this case, because you don't have contact. So there's a Kinect overlooking the scene and computing distances between the robot and the human. And when the distance is too close, the robot will recede and abandon a task and resume the task as soon as it understand that uh, the space is again free. And this is the coexisting part. Uh, we have seen the safety part, so detecting collision. The coexistence is sharing the workspace without touching each other. And then there's a collaboration phase. When the user grasps the robot, fast enough that the robot cannot escape, and we are faster than the robot, in fact, when we are very close, 
then the robot understands that you want to have a collaboration and then will follow whatever forces you apply to the robot. Okay, so this is the big picture. I will let the audio on so I don't have to speak, otherwise there will be a resonance. Because this is uh, illustrated with some music, which is not the best thing, but uh, there are also some texts, so I will not speak on top of this. So let me open this. Within the FP7 European between humans and robots that goes beyond conventional solutions. Safety is the most important feature for robots working close to humans. Coexistence is the robot capability of sharing its workspace with other entities. Collaboration occurs when the robot performs a complex task with a direct human interaction and coordination. Safety is guaranteed by a collision avoidance method Based on a bad sense. So we are using the for computing distance. This is the image of the Kinect team. And those three lines are the distances of the computing distance. Static or moving obstacles are detected, checked, and avoided. Multiple obstacles are avoided as well. Except for the end effect, all other robot body structures will treat obstacles as geometrical strains in terms of space. A collaboration phase is started by the user with a simple gesture. So, who will need the gesture? I want to collaborate. This mm -hmm. geometric information is collected with the joint corpse resulting from the contact, as obtained by our residual base estimate. Combining this data allows an estimation of the exchange of forces at the contact point. Those used by now we are collaborating, so using the force estimated by the request and the collaboration method, the robot follows this force in the system. Of course, uh, this is a hierarchical strategy, so uh, if you want to collaborate, you still have to avoid any other collision. So you have a priority even in this case. This is very clear. If you're coming to this to follow the command that hits another part of the body, then the robot resists because coexistence is more important than collaboration. And safety is more important than to speak to the computer. Okay, this is a hierarchical So, so the idea here is that this robot should exit their constrained world where there are cages, there are sensors that prevents the user to get uh, closer to the robot because they are lightweight. Of course, I would never do this with a Titan robot of uh, 1,500 kilograms, because even if it reacts in one millisecond, it has a, that amount of energy that I would be killed in, in any case. So the robot should be lightweight, but then coexistence and collaboration should be programmed by suitable control. Okay, so uh, I think that well, we, we can see this uh, video. This is some development that we made to show that we can uh, implement uh, that we can implement impedance control, like you have seen in the previous case, not only at the end effector level, but since we can detect where is the contact and we can estimate the force at the contact, even if we don't have sensor, then we impose an impedance model at any point of contact. Okay, so this is a generalization of the impedance control and we still can modify the inertia at the contact. Now uh, Emanuele is pushing the robot in any possible way and the robot reacts with this mass spring damper uh, model that we have seen before. 
However, since we are estimated force, we can also regulate the contact force. So, we, as we said, at any contact point, uh, we would like to have an exchange of forces which is, let's say, 50 Newton. Well, we don't measure this 50 Newton, but we estimate it with our method, and then we regulate this estimate to a desired value. So, in this case, the robot, if I'm pushing too hard, the robot goes back because it wants to reduce the contact force. If I'm pushing too little, the robot comes against me because it wants to seek for this 15 Newton of reference contact force. Okay, and this again can be done by hitting the robot at any point in any direction and regulated the contact force in this way. As you can imagine, what is the use of this? These are elementary bricks that you develop for a possible application, for instance, for the fact that the robot, there may be a bimanual robot holding an object. So without the need of sensorizing everything, you can feel the contact forces and then understand if you're grasping in a firm way the object or not. Okay, so even without the human. So there is a, a, a number of things that can be done with this technique. Okay, so we are done, so let me remind a few uh, organizational staff. Uh, I have student hours every Tuesday between 12 and 1.30, and this goes on until June. Then we have summer times. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot meet in person. Uh, we are not yet allowed to do this, so this will be Google Meet uh, meeting. So just connect, I always use this address. So if you want to speak with me or for any reason related to robotics too, uh, you enter to this meeting at 12 o'clock of Tuesday. Of course, if we are allowed later on to have a physical uh, presence, then my room is at the second floor here at the diet, uh, at the department. And in case I'm traveling, I'm not traveling much <laughs> these days, but I have a, a, a page on my website where you can find the expected travel dates or other events, maybe in Rome, in which case uh, lectures and uh, student hours are canceled in occasion of these very few events. Again, I, as I was said, uh, for any communication that are not really personal, uh, if they are personal, use my email. Otherwise, put your question, doubt, or curiosity on the group so that I can reply and everybody can take advantage of this. Uh, well, I put this only, so the course material is there with video, slides in PDF, uh, zipped forward with groups of videos that are related to one particular set of slides. Okay, you have a syllabus that describe where the video <laughs> appear. You have a syllabus that describe the relation between the textbook, the subject in the program, the slides. So <laughs> you have any possible support with this. And you have also all the exams that I published, I mean, that I made so far. Most of them are with solution. And we will use this. Uh, I will do some of this exercise in class, even if you have the solution because doing it on the blackboard, it's always different. I mean, you can uh, immediately say, why are you doing this or not? Uh, I received many, many questions on exercise, although the solution is there. So this means, although I try to make very extensive solution, not the one that I expect from you, but because these were intended as exercises in the broad sense. Okay, so we will do use this in the classroom. And uh, apart from the video that I show like this. Some of them are uh, homemade, so from our lab. Uh, other video that I show in class are uh, collected from colleagues or from the web. But we have, for all the research activity, we have a video channel of the robotics lab, of the Diag Robotics lab. So if you go to the channel, you will find several playlists and organized in stuff. So all the stuff of you for research experimentally, uh, is there. So some of these video are also shown in the classroom, some other are more advanced and you can find it there if you're interested. 
So, uh, last slide is about exams and about possible master thesis. So, as I said, we will do a remote midterm mid test. Let me see. Uh, okay, no special question. Uh, this will uh, occur after treatment of uh, advanced kinematic topics and dynamic, so before going to the control. So more or less, it will be the first half of the month of April. Uh, so you can do this uh, remote midterm test. It will be done like a regular exam if you've done this before. So using zoom plus exam.net. Uh, I always do exam with open books. So you can use your whatever. You can uh, use your programs. You can use MATLAB, C++, Python, whatever to do the exam. The only thing that you cannot do is collaborate with somebody else uh, in any way. Okay, this is, I know that this happens. I know that this is highly unfair. So uh, the only thing that I can do is that if I realize that, uh, then there will be consequences. Other than that, you're free to do perform a test. So if you're satisfied with the result of your remote meter test, you can keep the grade. And if you're very high, very good, so you're in the highest part, then you can have a sign a project uh, that you can do by yourself or in collaboration with a group of two, three peers. People. And then if you choose this, you're done with the written part and you do the project, you do the final presentation, you write the report and you get a, a grade for robotics team. Uh, if you're not satisfied with your grade or you're not good enough to get to the project or you don't want to do the project, even if you have a very good grade, then you do the usual uh, exam. Uh, if you have a, a sufficient grade, you can keep that grade and so you will do the written exam only on the remaining part. If you're not satisfied or you're not done the test, you have to do the full written exam. and. The oral part, which I always indicate, but almost never do, is there only to say that if I have some doubts, I would like to discuss your uh, uh, paperwork orally and maybe do some question you know, related to what you have done or to some other part of the program, okay? Any question on this? Otherwise, the schedule of exam is already there. All the exams are, uh, you can find it in, in the web page of the course, on my web page. So there will be a, one in June, one in July, one in September, and then two more sessions in January, February of next year. So five se regular sessions per year, which is far more than what your colleagues have in other universities in Europe and outside Europe. Uh, there are, uh, the booking is made on InfoStud. Remember, we have a recommendation that we close the booking 10 days before, okay? Uh, and I have only one session open at the time. So if you go to InfoStud, you find only one session, the next session open. If you know, want to know when the session here, here, here is it, and look at the website for any updates of that. And of course, there are, also extra session, which are intended for uh, students of the third or higher year, so for the course, so part-time or with any disability. And there are, I mean, there's a rule for the old Sapienza, which are in April and October. Okay. But unfortunately, these are not open for you, okay? They will be open <laughs> if you are not able to do the exam by then, okay? So finally, thesis. Uh, we don't run, me and my colleagues, Professor Riolo, Venditelli, Lamari, all the groups of the robotics lab of DIAG, uh, we don't run uh, an updated list. We have on the page a number of thesis subjects. Some of them, some of these subjects are gone, but at least give you an idea of what the type of things uh, we offer. Some are with companies, 
nowadays it's very difficult to have a thesis with a company because they have restriction, the same even farther restriction that we have at the university. But still, uh, some of these uh, are the result of collaboration that we have within uh, European research project or with former colleagues or former PhD students of ours that now work in Spain or France or Germany or in other places in Italy. Okay, so there are multiple things. So this is just a sample of what you can, you can find. Okay, then contact the uh, person that it's related to that and he or she will tell you what are the latest uh, uh, subject. Okay, I think that we're done with this. Uh, there is some question. Uh, so if there's a possibility of taking robotics one and two in June. Uh, first of all, is this the last? Let me see. Okay, so do the project presentation take place in the same date? No, project presentation, well, uh, it's too early to that, but essentially when after the, um, the result of the remote meter test, I will ask who wants to keep this and who wants to do the project. Then I will present before the end of the course uh, subject for the project. I will do the assignment and then the project goes by itself. You only have to complete it by the end of the year. So by December 2020, uh, 2021, uh, with some exception. Okay, so the, the project presentation are handled per, on a personal basis. So the second question is, is there the possibility of taking robotics one and two in June? Uh, where is it? Oh, sorry. Uh, sure, um, but again, you have to complete robotics one and have uh, uh, the, the grade registered in Infostud before you can sit down and write the robotics two exam. Okay. Instead, you can do the midterm even if you have not completed robotics one. Second issue, the midterm is intended only for students that are in the first year of their master's because this is the year in which the course needs to be delivered and we are not collecting past students. And this would be a, an enormous work. So you have the year window. If you miss it for any reason, then you will do the conventional exam. So uh, a question about the Google group. Unfortunately, I'm not registered to the Google group. You can register to the Google group. It's still open. Sure. Just go to my page. There is a, the address of the group. You go there. And, and uh, nobody follows my instruction, but still you can get there. Okay. And then if somebody is unsatisfied by the grade obtained with the project, can he upgrade the project instead? No. <laughs> no, no. We don't go back. I mean, you, you do the project. Uh, typically the project, I mean, I would love to have the project go completely open loop in the sense that I assign the topics, I give the material, I set the goal, then the group or the person evolves by itself and it present, I'm ready to do the presentation. This never happens. There's a lot of interaction. So once you're there, after this interaction, I evaluate the project and that's it. Okay, so the fact that students are allowed to refuse the grade is something which it's not so good because uh, uh, the attitude is, well, I try, then I can refuse. Uh, this is not good enough. So definitely no. More question, more question from the room? No? Okay, so be prepared uh, by, let's say, by the dinner time, you will receive the message with the prescription of what you should do before the next lecture, which will be on Wednesday. So all will be written clearly. Thanks for attending.